thanks very much, everybody. Um, the next uh, slot is a solo slot uh, um, with somebody you'll be familiar with who just sat on the, the, the panel. Uh, and it's Carl Kleinhans, and he's the Chief Executive Officer of Diversity Urban Property Fund. And he's going to talk about the investment opportunity in African rental housing. Thanks very much. Thank you. So um, this, this talk, <laughs> when I was offered the opportunity to do it initially, was going to be in the, the sustainable investment stream, not in the built environment stream. So my thinking was initially that I was going to have an audience of people who have already made up their minds that they want to invest into essentially sustainable investments and green infrastructure, and then I was going to convince them that housing is the place to go. But seeing that this is now in the building stream, I'm assuming that those of you who left in the room are already convinced on housing as an asset class. So what I'm going to try and do is tell you why this is one of the most sustainable things that you can be doing with your money, both as an investor, but also as an investment professional looking to deploy capital or even originate deals in the space. So um, there are a couple of high level points I want to quickly try and get across. And I'm going to try and do it as quickly as possible. And then maybe we can have time for some questions as well. Um, the first point is the first overarching point is that when it's done right, uh, investment into residential as an asset class can be profoundly sustainable. And I'll substantiate why I say that in a moment, but just keep that thought in the back of your mind. The second point, and we've already kind of touched on it a bit in the panel before, is that this asset class is enormous. Um, and again, if your objective is to deploy large sums of capital into a specific mandate, and that mandate is sustainable or you know kind of climate oriented in investing then the, the point I'd like to pose to the audience today is that rental housing can really fit that kind of niche for you quite well and um, and the, the final point here is you know if you want to invest sustainably at scale you know make sure you don't miss this asset class because you might be missing a beat so you know why do we say rental housing is a sustainable place to put your money. Um, the first point, and this is something that often gets, you know, a point that gets made at COP conferences and, you know, all kinds of forums on climate finance around the world, is that the built environment ultimately accounts for an enormous part of greenhouse gas emissions globally, right? The number that gets thrown around is 40%. I mean, it depends really on how you're measuring it and what's included and what's not. But the bottom line is that there's kind of broad global recognition of the fact that um, the built environment is a major contributor to the kind of climate challenge that we're facing collectively. And this is reflected in the fact that in the UN Sustainable Development Goals, one of the large SDGs and one that gets a lot of emphasis is SDG 11, which is, and I'm going to read it so I don't get it wrong, uh, make cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. Sustainable being the kind of word there in the, in the climate sense, but these other words, inclusive, safe, and resilient, also speak to what I think people are broadly understanding to be the broader definition of sustainability. It needs to be socially sustainable as well. Um, it needs to be inclusive and kind of of a, of, a, of a manner that is creating the kind of societies that we'd like to see and live in. And I think this is being increasingly recognized under the banner of sustainability. So to this end, uh, I'm sure some of you in the audience might be familiar with IFC EDGE. So the IFC, the International Finance Corporation, put together some years ago, I'm not actually sure how long ago, perhaps 10 years ago, um, a standard for assessing the um, effectively climate performance of individual buildings at the asset level. And it's called EDGE, and it's a tool that's accessible online, it's fairly easy to use, and it essentially allows developers to check whether a development that they're you know, about to proceed with development with is actually sustainable at the asset level. It specifically looks at the embodied energy within the construction materials used, the um, energy usage of the building and water usage of the building post-completion. And this has become essentially a standard for investment, um, especially by DFIs, into the housing space. And it's quite broadly used, especially in South Africa. However, um, and I think EDGE has done a lot to kind of put the notion on the map that you can invest quite sustainably within real estate. But a, a thought I want to leave you with, and I just like to share a bit of work from a recent study, research study that we were recently involved in, is that it's not just about the sustainability of the building itself, but also it's about the sustainability of the way in which you're building the buildings in terms of the context of the greater urban environment. So just bear with me for a second, and I'll, I'll try and get this point across. 
the, these are two images of just the urban footprint of the city of Johannesburg from 1990, so just before you know, the end of apartheid and before a big kind of period of economic growth within South Africa, up until 2013, where you know, this is kind of like the, the heydays of South Africa's economic expansion, the period covered here. And the purple area just shows the increase of the footprint of Johannesburg. And the, the point I want to get across here is that Johannesburg is a beautiful case in point of a city that's experienced massive urban sprawl over this period. And the result of it is a profoundly unsustainable urban form. So a lot of the buildings that are built here that are covered under this purple area would be considered sustainable at the asset level. They might be edge rated, but they're ultimately contributing to a pattern of urban development that is ultimately incredibly unsustainable. But I mean, there is hope. So bear with me. Um, this is just a picture of if you Google affordable housing Africa, then this is typically the, the image that I think comes to mind for a lot of people that are thinking about affordable housing. And this is not sustainable at all, right? But this is also the reality of how most affordable housing gets delivered on the continent, because building housing on cheap land at the urban periphery is often the cheapest way to do it. And it's often also the easiest way to do it at scale because you get these large parcels of land that you can develop on. However, and again, this comes back to why is investing in the right kind of housing so sustainable? If you do, um, if you do it slightly differently, there's an incredible environmental kind of potential benefit that can be reaped as a result. So as Diversity, we co-commissioned a piece of research with the Green Building Council of South Africa, and the research was done by Arup, the global consulting engineering firm, to look at the life cycle carbon emissions associated with alternative modes of specifically housing development within the context of urban development. So we looked at developing affordable housing at the urban periphery, which is kind of the dominant mode, as I mentioned before, this picture. And then we also looked at developing affordable housing within a high density kind of configuration in well-located areas, which is something that looks a lot more like the kind of image that I showed in the, in the previous panel. And the, not to get into the details of it, but the bottom line is that there, <clears throat> if you're looking at this over an, 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 the entire life cycle, so let's call it, a, we, we used 60 years um, as, the, as the duration of the study, then the the life cycle carbon emissions resulting, and this is just carbon, right, the, like many other aspects of sustainability, but the, the life cycle carbon emissions emitting from, uh, um, emanating from these different modes of development are profoundly different. It's more than a 2x difference over the period for urban peripheral development at the one extreme versus centrally located urban development as the other extreme. And to, just to again contextualize this, we then overlaid that data with the urban development trajectory of Johannesburg as a city. And again, these numbers are very theoretical, but kind of they serve to make the point quite well. And that is that over a 60 year period, just based on the city of Johannesburg alone's urban developmental trajectory, if you look at the, the trajectory at the two extremes, you're looking at over 224 million metric tons of carbon, emi um, carbon emitted between these two. So just to, uh, between these two scenarios. So to put that into context, that's the amount of um, carbon emitted by burning 56 um, coal power stations for a year, average coal power station size, or it's over 10, 10 times the annual carbon emissions of the city of Johannesburg in totality. So the point I'm trying to make here, and I'm really rushing through it, is that if you build, if you invest in affordable housing in a manner that is um, well located, close to amenities, close to job opportunities, close to where people go every day, the resulting economic impact of doing it in that, ma that manner as opposed to investing at the urban periphery is, is a profound difference in the overall sustainability of, um, of those types of investments. So I'm just going to, this is my last slide. So the first point I made is investing in the right kind of housing is incredibly sustainable. The second point I want to make is the size of this opportunity is huge. So this is you know, what I'm going to call armchair economics. It's very, um, very subject to scrutiny. But again, I hope you'll give me the benefit of the doubt and just kind of play along for the moment. So the African Development Bank estimates that there'll be 280 million additional middle income households by 2050. Middle income households in this context, and these are all present value um, in like 2020 value terms, um, earn about $3,900 per annum. So just simple math, multiplying that out, that's $1.1 trillion of income per year. If everybody earns the bottom end of what is the, like the entry criteria for what is considered middle class, right? So 
it's safe to assume that many people will earn significantly more than this, and this is in present value terms. So that's, uh, and then if you assume that people are spending on average a third of their income on housing, that's $330 billion per annum of housing spend. So uh, average share of renters globally, 40% of populations in Africa, that's again much higher. Um, the point was made in the previous panel that the amount of people who rent in Africa is just disproportionately higher compared to other markets. So you're looking at just within the rental space in Africa, at least minimum in present value terms, $130 billion per annum of rental spend. Capitalize at a 10%, you know, choose your cap rate, whatever you want to use. That's a $1.3 trillion asset base that still needs to be created, right? These are not assets that presently exist. This is a new market that needs to come to the fore. So the point I want to make is the, the amount of capital formation that will take place within the rental space, regardless, is enormous. There is a potential to develop those assets in a manner that is profoundly sustainable and will be recognized as being incredibly sustainable in terms of you know, sustainable investment criteria. So if, as an institution, your objective is to deploy capital at scale into assets that meet your sustainability criteria, meet climate action criteria, and you need to deploy large amounts of capital you know, at a time, then you're missing a beat if you're not considering affordable rental housing as a potential destination for that capital. And the last stat I just have there is that, you know, in the last 10 years, a period of massive growth within solar PV in Africa, only $20 billion were invested in um, solar panels in Africa, essentially. That's one-tenth of the value of the rental sector in South Africa at present, and it's an, a tiny fraction of the amount of investment opportunity there will be in this asset class over the next 30 years. And I'll kind of close with that. Are there any questions? You can see we've got another minute or so to go. Nope. Right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end there then and say I've kind of like summarized the point. It's a uh, sustainable investment opportunity at scale and you're missing a beat if you're not considering it as a space to deploy your capital. Can I hand back to you, Chair? Cool.